I'm recording. Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce Kaloyan Slavov from ETH Zurich, uh, who will talk about a refinement of Bertini irreducibility via point counting over finite fields. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antoni. Mm, the goal today is to look at Bertini irreducibility theorems from the point of view of point counting over finite fields and this random sampling lemma that we introduced last time. This is uh, joint work with Bjorn Poonen. Okay, let K be a field. Not necessarily algebraically closed, not necessarily of characteristic zero. If you want, take it to be algebraically closed when I state the theorems. The classical Bertini irreducibility theorem states as follows. Let X inside Pn over K be a geometrically irreducible subvariety. We allow locally closed of dimension greater than or equal to two. Then the way you usually state it is you would say there is a dense open locus inside the dual projective space of hyperplanes so that any hyperplane there intersects X in a variety which is also geometrically irreducible. But I'll give it a little twist. Let M bet, I look at the bad locus, not, in the, not at the good locus, inside PN dual, PN dual parameterizing hyperplanes in PN be the locus parameterizing hyperplanes, I abbreviate like this, H, such that X intersect H is not, this is the bed locus, is not geometrically irreducible. Then the way you usually would say, state it is then the complement of embed contains a dense open. But I would state it, embed is contained in a proper closed subset, or I would say dimension of embed less than or equal to n minus one. Embed is a constructible set, and uh, I can talk about its dimension. If you want, um, take the largest dimension of a uh, sub-variety contained in embed, or if you want to write embed as a union of finitely many locally closed sub-schemes and take the largest dimension, we can talk about dimensions of constructible sets inside P and K. This is the classical Bertini theorem, but you can ask the following question. Does the dimension of embed really reach n minus one? It's quite hard for the dimension of embed to reach n minus one. Very often, it's actually much smaller. The bed locus is actually much smaller. This is answered in a theorem by Olivier Benoit, 2011. In fact, he proves dimension of embed is quite small, especially if X has large dimension inside PN. He proves that dimension of embed less than or equal to codimension x plus one. Codimension meaning codimension inside Pn. The most striking case of this, oops, for example, eg, if x is a hypersurface, if it's codimension one in Pn, then dimension of the bed locus less than or equal to two, you can have at most a two dimensional family of bad hyperplanes. At most a two dimensional family. Now his bound is sharp. Let me give an example, e.g. I can take X to be the vanishing of. Now let's take something that only involves, now inside PN, let's take something that only involves three of the variables. Maybe X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared. So it's a cone over a plane curve. And then a generic 
h being vanishing of ax plus by plus cz. A generic h of this form, if you represent z as a linear function of x and y and plug it in, you get a homogeneous polynomial in two variables that will factor, geometrically it will factor. So such a, an h is in embed, is in the bed locus. So yes, you can have a two-dimensional bed locus, but that's it for a hypersurface, two is the largest dimension of of a family of bad hyperplanes that you can have. Benoit uses the generation techniques. We are giving a different proof based on point counting over finite fields. And in fact, sorry, our... sorry. Yes? sorry. Can, I, can I interrupt you? But I have not really uh, understood. When uh, uh, embeds does reach uh, n minus one, can you give an example, please? Yes, yes, yes. So here, uh, this is an example in the case um, uh, of a hypersurface in the hyper in the hypersurface i can give similar examples in any co-dimension if i start uh, if we start with c a curve in a p p n minus 1 for example c in a p n minus 1 let's say with coordinates um, x0 xn xn minus one inside pn, pn, then a generic h equals vanishing of a0 x0 plus an minus one xn minus one. A generic h like that will will have a reducible intersection with C. It will be in embed. So this is an N minus one dimensional mm. just one moment. Yes. So this is an N is in embed. I can do this in any co-dimension. Maybe I should say here in PM, let's say in PM, M, XM minus one. And here I say XM minus one. So a generic H like this is in embed in the bed locus. And uh, our variety X is the cone over C, so to speak. I start with the curve C. And then I take the variety defined by the same equations, but consider it in all the variables. And if I take an H, which is of this form, which only involves the variables X0 up to XM minus one, the intersection will be reducible. So here, this, is, this example is when X is a hypersurface when the codimension is one, but you can do, you can, you can uh, generalize this example to work in any codimension. So yes, the bound is sharp. You can reach codimension x plus one, but that's the best you can do. The best you can do. The most striking case is the case of a hypersurface. And uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, did the embed and codimension get interchanged? I'm having a little difficulty following the example. Uh, just one moment. So here, uh, a generic H. Did uh, what and what got interchanged? I mean, uh, in the example that you gave, the co-dimension was what? Aha. Uh, so here, X is the vanishing here. So X is a hypersurface. X is a hypersurface. It's given by the vanishing of this one polynomial. Yeah. But I can think of X as the cone over a plane curve. So X has co-dimension one and then H, any H like this is in embed. So I have a two dimensional bed family. And this example just generalizes. This generalizes to other co-dimensions. If I take a curve C, not in a P2, but in a PM. Yeah. And then I look at the cone over C. So the same equations that define C, but consider it in all the variables. Yeah. Then a generic H like this is in embed. 
Okay. Yes. Okay. So that's what happens. Dimension of M bet is uh, small when uh, X has large dimension inside PN. Our method uses a reduction to finite fields. And in fact, with our method, we prove a more general statement theorem. Poonan and myself. Let X to PN, P, phi be a morphism with X a geometrically irreducible variety. Oh, by the way, I should say here, let me just say here, in the classical Bertini theorem, we have this assumption that dimension X is at least two. It's, uh, it's essential because otherwise uh, generic hyperplane will intersect it in uh, just a bunch of points, as many as the degree. But in the Benoit version, you don't have to make that assumption because if X is a curve, the right-hand side uh, in, the, in the bound is equal to N, the statement is trivial, but true. You don't have to make an assumption on the dimension of X. Okay, so here is our version. You have a morphism. X is a geometrically reducible variety. We have to make an assumption here. Suppose all non-empty fibers of phi have the same dimension. I'll comment on this assumption. And then again, let M bet embed inside pn duo be the it will end up constructible be the constructible locus parameterizing hyperplanes h such that the pullback fine verse h is not geometrically reducible the bad hyperplanes. If you pull them back, it's not geometrically reducible. And then dimension of embed is again quite small. It's less than or equal to co-dimension of the image plus one. So our morphism here doesn't have to be an immersion. For example, the, oops, here, Sharing device audio. No, no, no. Uh, for example, for example, the most striking case, if phi is dominant, if in addition phi is dominant, then dimension of embed less than or equal to one. You can have at most a one dimensional family of bad hyperplanes. If you have a dominant map from a geometrically reducible variety to projective space, all fibers have the same dimension. There is at most a one dimensional family of bad hyperplanes. Everything outside of that has geometrically reducible pre-image. Okay, now let me give a non-example why we have to make the assumption on on the non on the non empty fibers having the, the same dimension non example take the blow up of pn at some point let's say origin call it the origin down to pn then embed embed consists of the hyperplanes passing through the origin these are the bad ones then the the pullback has uh, is not geometrically reducible. So then dimension of embed is equal to n minus one. And that's why we have to make this assumption that the non-empty fibers have the same dimension. Okay, let me give you an example. Example, you can create examples. For example, let's say vanishing of y square minus xn inside a n plus one x1 until xn until y, mapping down to a n with x1, xn. If you want to put it in pn, doesn't matter if you work off in a projective space. Now, what are the bad hyperplanes? A bad hyperplane 
must be of the form. What is the linear substitution of is x smooth in the theorem? No, 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 x doesn't have to be smooth. Um, a bad hyperplane? I have to make a linear substitution of one of the x's in terms of the others, substitute, and then let's see if I get something geometrically reducible. The only way this can fail is when xn is a constant. So we see we have a one dimensional family of bad hyperplanes. You can take a polynomial in the x's and in y and you ask how often is it the case that when I substitute one x linearly in terms of the other x's and then plug it in, if the original polynomial is geometrically reducible, how often does it happen that this fails to be geometrically reducible? So you can see that this is a version of Hilbert irreducibility. Hilbert irreducibility. That's what Hilbert irreducibility. That's what Hilbert irreducibility is about. You have an, an irreducible polynomial and you make substitutions. You get the polynomial in fewer variables. Is it still irreducible? How often does it fail to stay irreducible? And here, most it fails very, very rarely, only on a one-dimensional family of bad hyperplanes. Okay, so that's um, that's the statement. Now the proof, the proof. Let me go to the. Now we are going to do the proof for expository purposes. We are going to present the proof when X is a hypersurface, because this case already illustrates all the ideas, and then going from there to the general case is only a little bit more notation and a couple of technicalities. So now take a hypersurface. Let x in Pn be a hypersurface, geometrically reducible. And we'll prove that's the most striking case of the theorem, anyways. So we'll prove dimension of embed less than or equal to 2. This number two should come out of somewhere. I have to produce the number two in the end. I have to, I have to make that two. It will show up. How is it going to appear? That's the question. I have to, I have to write down some stuff, and then the two should uh, pop up. Now, the way we do it is we reduce to the case. We reduce to the case. K finite. When the ground field is finite. That's why I didn't want to state it over an algebraically closed field, but over an arbitrary field. Now, the way you reduce to the case of a finite field K is uh, a standard argument, but um, let's go over it. The way you do it is you say there exists a finitely generated Z algebra. algebra R contained in K, in particular an integral domain, such that your hypersurface in Pn over K comes from a hypersurface in Pn over R as follows. Here is your hypersurface X in Pn over K, over spec K. There will be a hypersurface in Pn over R. There will be something here, so that when you base change by spec K to spec R, you get exactly your, this is the original one. Now, I want to avoid further unnecessary notation, so I'll be renaming objects. The one over PNR, I'm now going to call X, and the original is XK. So this is your original, and there exists a hypersurface in PNR. This is because your hypersurface is defined by a polynomial with coefficients in K. It has finitely many coefficients, and these coefficients generate a finitely generated Z subalgebra of K. You can take the ring that they generate. So now I have this X over spec R. The advantage over spec R is that I can base change not only 
to the generic point, I can take not only generic fiber, I can also take special fibers. Now, here, by assumption, the generic fiber... Sorry, but your field is characteristic zero. No, I don't have to assume it because um, this is yeah, a because uniform... How do you inter yeah, yeah, but how do you then uh, find finitely generated Z algebra inside K? Finitely generated... Uh, Z algebra, it's still, I take uh, the Z sub algebra of K generated by all the coefficients of the polynomial. I don't have to assume. Uh, yeah, because uh, what I see, yeah, uh, what I see in your writing uh, is a sub algebra of K. And uh, so one, uh, one thing is torsion free, the right hand side can be torsion. Uh, which, which one, uh, say again, if... Um... Uh, so again, uh, if I start with the field of characteristic P, then uh, if I read directly what is written, there exists uh, a Z-algebra inside K, yeah? Yes. In particular, Z, uh, a Z, uh, ah, sorry, I, I, I missed, yeah, sorry. Uh, yes. Stupid question. Stupid question. Sorry. Ah, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> no worries. Uh, my poly my hypersurface is defined by a polynomial, and I take the sub ring of K generated as a ring by the finitely many coefficients of this polynomial. Yes. So here, the generic fiber, I have R. R is an integral domain. It has a fraction field, and K is just a, an extension field of the fraction field. So XK being geometrically reducible means the generic fiber of this map, of this map, is geometrically reducible. Because this is our assumption on the original hypersurface. Now, the set of points in spec R such that the fiber is geometrically reducible, is constructible. This is one of the, one, one of those theorems in EGA. Now, therefore, we can shrink spec R if necessary. to assume that for each P in spec R, the fiber XP, which is now inside the projective space over the residue field at P, is a geometrically reducible. I can assume it's geometrically reducible because the locus where the fiber is geometrically reducible is constructible and contains the generic point. So it contains an open, a dense open. It's, ge it's a geometrically reducible. Let's also assume it's also a hypersurface. N minus one dimensional. The locus of points where the dimension of the fiber is equal to the dimension of the generic fiber also is also constructible and also contains the generic point. Okay, so now we shrink spec R if necessary to assume this. As you see, we're going to, to look at fibers over closed points. Now build the following diagram. Build the following diagram. Consider here the universal family of hyperplanes, but over PN dual, and now we are working over R. So this is the universal family of hyperplanes. The fiber over a point corresponding to a hyperplane is that hyperplane. It also maps to Pn over R. If you want to think explicitly, you should be having in mind an incidence correspondence. Point and the hyperplane, point is in the hyperplane. Maps to the space of hyperplanes, maps to the space of points. Here is our X, not the original, but the one that is over spec R. And here we have a family curly X. Now we are in position to define a universal bed locus. Our embed, if I scroll up a little bit, our embed is inside the projective space over K. But now we are going to define a universal embed. 
define embed as the set of all points psi in Pn dual over R, such that the fiber X psi is not geometrically reducible. By the same theorem from EGA, this is mm, this is constructible. So here is this embed inside Pn over R, and it maps to spec R. Now I can take base changes. I can take spec kappa of p for a point p in spec r. I can take the generic point. If I base change this embed, if I look at its fiber over the generic point, I get the original embed, the embed whose dimension I have to bound by two. But I can also look at the closed point p. And here I get, I have pn over the residue field. And here I can base change embed p. We are allowed to base change a constructible set. You can write it as a union of locally closed and then base change each of them and then take again the union or just take pre-image. Either way, you can base change a constructible set. And now the embed here, the fiber of the universal embed is the bed locus corresponding to the hypersurface, which is the fiber of X over that point P. And now to prove dimension of embed sub k, the generic fiber less than or equal to two, this is what we were initially looking at. It suffices to prove, to prove dimension embed kappa of p less than or equal to two for each closed point P in spec R. If, well, the, dim the dimension of the generic fiber is equal to the dimension of uh, all the fibers in some dense open. So if I can bound the dimensions of the fiber of embed when I take a, um, when I take a closed point, this will give me a bound for the generic dimension, the dimension over the generic point. But now, if P is a closed point in spec R, R is a finitely generated Z algebra. If I have a finitely generated Z algebra and the maximal ideal, when I mod out by the maximal ideal, we get a finite field. So this is a finite field. And therefore, it suffices to assume that our ground field K is finite. From now on, K is finite. And from now on, again, embed as in the beginning is contained in PN check over K. So from now on by embed, I will refer to the generic fiber of the I will refer to the special fiber of this universal embed, or embed will be as it was in the beginning. So far, so we reduce to the case of finite fields. This reduction is a standard argument, so to speak. Okay, but now over a finite field, we have cardinality tools. We can do point counting. Let's see what, what will happen if we attempt to do point counting over finite fields. So here, consider FQ over K. K is a finite field, consider extensions of K and think about FQ as a large finite field. Let's see what happens if we try, let's attempt to count the number of FQ points on MBAT to see how many bad hyperplanes are there over FQ. Here is our hypersurface X inside PN and we base change over FQ. So again, by X here, I will mean the original X, 
base change base changed over FQ. Now let's take a hyperplane. Hyperplane here and then intersect. Remember that H to be in embed of FQ, that's how we defined embed from the definition of embed. This means that X intersect H is not geometrically reducible. Not geometrically reducible. This was uh, the definition of um, embed. Now, let's do point counting. How many FQ points are there on X? The number of FQ points on X. We did it last time. X is a geometrically reducible hypersurface. It has roughly Q to the N minus one points with some error. We don't need to be too precise about the error this time because of Q to the N minus three halves. The implied constant depends on the degree of X and the ambient dimension N. Now, how about X intersect H? How many FQ points are going to be there? Well, let A be the number of FQ irreducible components of X intersect H that are geometrically irreducible. X intersect H is going to have pure dimension N minus two. Now don't worry about the case eight X being a hyperplane and H equals X. If H, if X is a hyperplane, the whole thing is trivial. There is no bad locus, it's empty. But um, X intersect H will have pure dimension N minus two and you split it into FQ reducible components. Those that are geometrically reducible, they will contribute Q to the dimension that many points. Those that are not geometrically reducible, we discussed this last time, they contribute very few points. So they don't matter for the point counting. And you might say there are points on the intersections of components, but these don't matter either because the intersections of components have lower dimension. So there will be few of them. And therefore the Lang veil bound tells you that the number of points in X intersect H the number of FQ points is equal to A, this number. Actually, I will write it in red because it will be very important. I want to flash it out. A times Q to the N minus two plus B co of Q to the N minus five halves. We are applying the Lang veil bound to X intersect H the FQ reducible components that are geometrically reducible, those will contribute to the point count. Okay, this is how many points, FQ points, X intersect H has. That's the number of points there. How many points do we expect it to have? As we vary the hyperplane H. Now, when I say how many points do we expect it to have, those who were at the previous lecture, they recognize they recognize I am hinting at the probability language of the random sampling lemma. The random sampling lemma, I will, we discussed it last time, I will state it again this time. So here is our lemma, A random sampling. Terry Tao's block. Again, it's a purely combinatorial lemma, set theoretic lemma. There is no algebraic geometry in it, but we will apply it there. Let, let X be a subset of the set of FQ points on projective space. Be a subset. For a hyperplane, H in PN over in PN of FQ, hyperplane, set theoretic hyperplane, just choose your homogeneous linear F equation with coefficients FQ, look at its FQ solutions, chosen uniformly at random. Uh, 
consider the intersect the number of points in the intersection x intersect h is a random variable We did it with planes last time. Now we're doing it with hyperplanes. Then the mean of this random variable is very easy to compute. It's the cardinality of x divided by q. That's, well, I should say 1 plus b co of q inverse. This factor is only because we are working in projective space. If we were working in affine space, it would be just x divided by q because each point belongs to 1 over q of all the hyperplanes. This is the mean and the variance. We have a bound on the variance. It's bounded by order of x divided by q. The variance is small. I said it last time. The reason this is easy to prove is that when you compute the variance, you have to compute the second moment. So you really need to compute how many hyperplanes pass through two distinct points of x for any two distinct points of x. But that number is independent of which two points you take. And that's why to prove it, it's very easy. You can compute mu and sigma squared. They do not depend too much on x. They only depend on the cardinality of x. Now, in the end of the talk, I will actually spell out the details of this because I have, I have a certain reason I want to spell it out, but we'll do it in the end. But now look, just look here. Look at this screen. I will make it smaller. Oh, there we go. Okay, so x of fq has roughly q to the n minus one points. Intersect with hyperplanes. The mean will be q to the n minus two, because the mean is uh, you divide by q, q to the n minus two, that's the mean. Most values should be concentrated close to the mean because the variance is small. When the variance is small, most values are concentrated close to the mean. But the only way to have concentrated values close to the mean is when a, is it a the, the invariant in red, is equal to one, because if a is not equal to one, it's either zero or at least two. And then there will be a big gap between the value, between your random variable and the mean. Therefore, most often a will be equal to one. There will be only few, very, very few hyperplanes where a is not equal to one. That's it. However, now we have to be careful. We are really counting hyperplanes now where a is not equal to one. So I give a definition, definition. A hyperplane H, PN check of FQ, is, let's call it very bad, if A is not equal to 1. That's what we are actually counting. We wish we would count the number of bad hyperplanes, but we are actually counting very bad hyperplanes. You see, a hyperplane could be bad without being very bad. It could be that it's bad, so x intersect h is not geometrically reducible, but it has exactly one geometrically reducible fq component. And maybe it has a few more fq components that are geometrically reducible. It's a little bit of a bummer, but it turns out that counting the very bad hyperplanes is sufficient for our purposes. So we're doing pretty well. I will, I will do it, but... Um, Okay, perfect. So very bad if a is not equal to one. And now with this calculation, as I explained, we have a bound on the number of very bad hyperplanes. Let's do it. Let's do it very quickly. So here, take x of fq as your set to which you apply the lemma inside pn of fq. And therefore the mean is q to the n minus two, one over q times, one over q of the number of elements in x of fq, plus b co of q to the n minus five halves. And the variance is b co of whatever you have in the mean, q to the n minus two. I will put this again in red, very important. This is our bound on the variance. Now, if h is very bad, If a hyperplane is very bad, the number of points x intersect h fq, fq points here, minus the mean. Well, if h is very bad, a is equal to zero 
or a greater than or equal to two, we are using that there are gaps between the integers. If a is not equal to one, then it will be very far out from the mean, either too small or too large. So this will be at least q to the n minus two minus b co of q to the n minus five halves greater than or equal to one half q to the n minus two for sufficiently large q. And therefore, probability that h is very bad, probability as h ranges over all the hyperplanes over fq, this probability is less than or equal to, well, let's call this t times sigma. This computation is similar to what we had before, definition of t less than or equal to one over t square by again Chebyshev's inequality. Chebyshev as we had it last time. Now let me just see. Okay, one over t square is equal to four sigma square divided by q to the two n minus four. And this is big O of sigma square is big O of q to the n minus two q to the n minus two divided by q to the two n minus four, all together b co of q to the two minus n. Here is the two, I promised you a two coming out from somewhere. Now multiply this, multiply by the total number pn check of fq by the total number of hyperplanes, which is q to the n, roughly q to the n. I only need that it's big O of q to the n. So multiply by this to deduce that the number of h in pn check over fq, which is very bad, is big O of q square. That's where the two comes from. If you were doing it not for a hypersurface, but for an R-dimensional variety, you would get here the co-dimension plus one. So that's it, the two came up. Now, this counts the very bad hyperplanes. Let me draw a picture so we know where we are. These are all the bad ones, M bad of FQ. Inside, we have the very bad with a not equal to one. And here are the bad, but not very bad with a equals one. Now, this is an upper bound on the number of very bad hyperplanes. This is the, the essence of the proof. However, we can also give a lower bound. It turns out that the, the number of very bad ones, the very bad ones form a certain proportion, a certain definite fraction of all the bad ones. So it turns out that this number is greater than or equal to a constant times Q to the dimension of M bad for some constant C, as long as the finite field is appropriately chosen large enough. If it's large enough, appropriately chosen as long as it contains some other field fq0. So there exists a constant and there exist arbitrarily large fields fq so that the inequality in the green holds. The very bad hyperplanes are at least a certain fraction of all the bad hyperplanes. Now once you have that, I will say a few words, but once you have that, just look at this chain of inequalities. On the right we have the big O of Q square bound, and therefore dimension of M bet less than or equal to two. That's what we were trying to prove. Now, what is in green is more like standard arguments, but a little tricky. The reason they're tricky is, let's say you have a hyperplane which is bad, but not very bad. So you have exactly one component, which is geometrically reducible, but some more components that are one component of X intersect H. Yes, H is such that X intersect H has one geometrically reducible component and maybe a few more which are which become geometrically reducible. 
Now, if you imagine that you extend the field, then some hyperplanes that are bad, but not very bad, will become very bad. Because those other components that I have in white, those other components, they will, if you extend the field, you will see more than one geometrically reducible components. But if you extend the field, you will also inflate, you'll get inflated by further hyperplanes that are bad, but not very bad. That's why it's tricky. The, the analog is here I have the elements of FQ and here are the quadratic residues. Residues and non-residues. If I extend, non-residues will become residues, but <laughs> no matter how I extend, you will get further non-residues. And um, this is similar to what happens. The residues are a certain fraction of all the elements. And here the very bad hyperplanes, if you extend appropriately, are a certain fraction of all the bad hyperplanes. So this is, um, the, really I'm focusing on the inequality, on the second inequality in the chain, on the right inequality, because that's the essence in the proof. That's where you get the bound. On the left, on the left, um, by the way, on the left, there is also a lang veil. We also use lang veil here again, that embed of FQ will have at least Q to the dimension of embed points if you enlarge the field appropriately. But I'm not, um, I will not go into details on the inequality in green. And that's it. That's how we get the two, just from this variance computation, from the bound on the variance. You calculate that for most most hyperplanes, when you intersect, you will have exactly one geometrically reducible component. Hyperplane section will have one geometrically reducible component. I can stop for a couple of questions here, and then, uh, and then, as as I promised, I will spell out the proof of the random sampling lemma. Yes, so we were initially, you know, you try to compute embed, but uh, what you compute is how often is it that A is not equal to one? Most of the time, A has to equal to one. Okay, now let's do quickly the random sampling lemma and then I'll tell you why I want to do it. So proof of random sampling. We have a subset. We have a subset X inside PN over FQ. And let me emphasize the case of interest. For us, the order of X is roughly Q to the N minus one, plus B co of Q to the N minus three halves. That's our, that's the case of interest for us. Now, when you hit it with a random hyperplane, mu is equal to fraction over the total number of hyperplanes. Here I have the number of pairs, x and h, so that x is in x intersect h. If you split it according to the hyperplane for each one, you get exactly x intersect h possibilities for x. That's why this is the mean. But if you split it according to the point x, you have that many, and for each little x, you have to count how many hyperplanes pass through this little x as a proportion. So times the probability that a given point belongs to h. Let's call it zero. Probability that the given point belongs to h. Let's call this probability p1. It's approximately one over q because I'm imposing one condition, roughly one over q of all hyperplanes will pass through the point. Now let's calculate the variance. Sigma square is this expected value of x intersect h square minus mu square. So again, it will be a fraction over the total number of hyperplanes minus mu square. And here I can write it as the number of triples x, y, and h, so that x and y are in x intersect h. 
for each H, I get exactly X in the order of X intersect H square choices for X and Y. That's why this is the expected value of the square of the number of points in X intersect H. Now, if I split this according to X and Y, when X is equal to Y, the count is exactly what we had before for the mean. When X is not equal to Y, I have that many choices for little x. Then I have that many choices for little y. And then times the probability that two distinct points, let's call them 0 and 1, belong to h. And then minus mu, we figured out it's x times p1, and we have mu square. So I square that. Okay, let's just, uh, let's finish and then we'll see, you will see why I'm doing this. So mu is the order of x times this p1, plus here I have the order of x squared. Let's combine this term with the last one, x squared. Let's call this probability p2. It's roughly one over q squared. Because if I impose two conditions that the hyperplane contains two points, zero and one, it's roughly one over Q square. You can write down the exact fraction if you want, but for now, let's say one over Q square. So X square, and then I have P2 minus P1 square, and then minus X times P2. Now it turns out that this is negative. That's what it turns out. When you write them down and uh, you just check that this is negative. So the whole thing is B co. Now X is like Q to the, n minus one, and I multiply by P1, which is like one over Q. So big O of Q to the n minus two. This was our bound for the variance. Remember, if I scroll up, we had sigma square was big O of Q to the n minus two. Okay, so this is the computation, very easy, yes? However, let's look more carefully. What about this term here? And what about this term here? X is like Q to the n minus one. And here I have x times the order of x times the order of x minus 1. I have roughly here q to the 2n minus 2 and then multiplied by p2, so 2n minus 4. This is how big that sum and is. And then x, the order of x is q to the n minus 1. When you square, it's q to the 2n minus 2 and minus two more, so q to the two n minus four again. So look, the variance is really the difference of two huge terms. Each of them is like q to the two n minus four. And when you subtract them, there is so much cancellation going on that you're left with only q to the big O of q to the n minus two. All the terms die out. And here is the big O of Q to the N minus two. Let me scroll up a little. I remind you that here we used sigma square is big O of Q to the N minus two and we plugged it in. But that, that's what happens here. That's what happens. You have so much cancellation. Now, let's say, I will finish with this remark. Suppose, let's say that we write, we write. Let's say that we're oblivious for most of that cancellation. Maybe we look at this and maybe we notice that the top terms cancel. The Q to the 2n minus 4 terms die out. They cancel. Remember, our errors go by a factor lower than the main terms. So suppose that we write this as bico sigma square as bico of Q to the 2n minus 4.5, if we notice that the top terms cancel because our error is square root of Q down, a factor square root of Q down, maybe we only notice that it's 2N minus 4.5. We don't see that it's Q to the N minus two. Let's go up. Okay, so if we write 2N minus 4.5 here, instead of n minus two, we would get bico, you can see two, two n minus 4.5 of 
q to the minus a half, yes? Instead of q to the two minus n, which I can write as O of q to the n minus a half minus n. In other words, this two that we were struggling to get to, we wanted to get to that two, this two is replaced by n minus a half. Much worse bound, but still a bound. And then we'll get dimension of the bed locus less than or equal to, rather than the really good bound dimension m bed less than or equal to two, we'll get that the dimension from the argument from what you have basically on the line below, that the dimension is less than or equal to n minus a half, that is to say less than or equal to n minus one. And this is the original Bertini theorem. This is the classical theorem by Bertini. Dimension of m bet is less than or equal to n minus one. If we only notice, if we only notice the, the cancellation of the top terms and write it as big O of q to the two n minus four and then minus another half, we recover the classical Bertini theorem. So I would say that our refinement of the Bertini theorem the improvement in the bound, the refinement is an acknowledgement that there is this further cancellation in the variance calculation. And I finish here. Okay, let's thank Kabuyan. Any thank questions? You, uh, sorry, where can I read the papers uh, the re uh, about the results? Uh, ah, the paper. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Um, I didn't uh, put the link. Let me give you the link. Uh, let me see how I can do it here. Um, let me... In, in the chat, you can you can send the archive yes, yes, on yes, the chat. Yes, 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 I can send it, but um, I have to figure out how to. Um, so let's see. Internet. No, I'm sharing the screen and. Uh, yeah, but uh, you can orally uh, mention uh, what is it an archive or published? Uh, yes, 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 yes. It's the, on the archive yeah, and the, published. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. It's. Uh, 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 I will just find it's on the archive and uh, published here, here on the archive. The exceptional locus in the Bertini reducibility theorem for amorphism. Ah, okay. With, uh, uh, Bjorn Puna. That is, yes. Yeah, January 2020. Okay, thank you. Yes, yes. And it's published in IMRN. Okay. Perfect. Yes, but in the paper, in the paper, we prove it when you have a morphism. And oh, by the way, when you have a morphism, then in this random sampling, you need the you need a good bound, a uniform bound on the size of the fibers. You can do the random sampling lemma combinatorially when you have a map, but then you need a bound on the number of elements in the fibers, and that's why we don't want the dimension of fibers to jump. That's why we make this assumption. Okay. Okay, Dobro. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. Any other questions? Ah, thank you, Yotam. Thank you. Kaluyan, can you give us a quick overview of what's uh, next? Next, in the next one, we'll solve another moduli space problem. We'll look at um, hypersurfaces. So, lecture three. Lecture three. Let's say X is the space of all hypersurfaces in P of K. K is an algebraically closed field. K of X0 until Xn, homogeneous degree L, such that dimension of the hypersurface defined by F of the singular locus is greater than or equal to B, where B is fixed. Question, what is the dimension of X? And what is the largest dimensional component? 
And again, you pass to finite fields. Yes, yes. We again pass to finite fields, and then we do point counting over finite fields. Mm, we're not going to use uh, random sampling anymore. We'll do different point counting. It will be a difficult point counting, and we'll do that uh, point counting. And in the last lecture, so today and next time, it's a geometric question, a question that uh, arises over an algebraically closed field, and we pass to finite fields. And in the last question, in the last lecture, we'll switch perspective and we'll look at an arithmetic question. I will state it now about point counting, and we will approach it geometrically. Now the question in the last lecture, lecture four, we can look at. So let FQ is a finite field. I can look at the probability that the polynomial T to the D plus A D minus one T to the D minus one plus A zero with coefficients in FQ of T. Probability that this is irreducible is irreducible. We know by a classical result of Gauss, this is roughly one over D as the coefficients vary in FQ. Okay. But what if you fix, fix all except A0 and A1? You only allow the linear piece to vary and let A0 and A1 vary in FQ. Is the probability, is the probability that if I have fixed the polynomial and I perturb it also linearly, only linearly, probability that this is irreducible, where lambda and mu are chosen uniformly at random in FQ, is this probability still approximately equal to one over D? You would expect it to be, you would hope so. Not always, but we'll give a criterion. We'll give a criterion. There is a lot of literature on this, but uh, the result will give extends some of the results in the literature. So we'll give a criterion. If the polynomial is sufficiently random, if it's uh, generic, if it's generic, then that should be the case. If you vary the last two coefficients, the probability should still be around one over D, but we want to give a specific criterion so that if you give me a specific polynomial, I can look if it satisfies the condition. And if yes, I can be sure that the probability is about one over D. This is purely arithmetic, you can try just looking at finite fields somehow, but we'll use a little bit of algebraic geometry. Not much, not much, but we'll, we'll, we'll think we'll approach this geometrically. That's what we'll do in the last lecture. All, about, all, all four lectures are point counting over finite fields with applications to algebraic geometry. Okay, thank Sorry, you. Sorry, uh, co yeah, could you recall me please, in the paper of Bjorn Punin uh, in the Annals 2004 about Bertini theorems of a finite field. Ah, yes, yes, he, uh, so this just will a be just, inspired. Just a second, uh, uh, did he use the same tricks with probabilities? Uh, so this lecture three, uh, the proof we'll give is inspired from Bjorn Poonen's uh, Bertini over finite fields. Okay, this is what I ex uh, suspected, thank you. Yes, Bertini over finite fields. So his paper Bertini theorems over finite fields uses an idea that we are going to use in this lecture three next time. That will be a certain point counting idea. We'll use it next time, yes. But uh, the random sampling, the random sampling is not, um, let me scroll up. It's not very popular. It's not very popular among the algebraic uh, geometers. On Terry Tao's block, he proves the lang veil bound by using random sampling. And then uh, we have the, the improvement of the Lang-Veil bound from the lecture one. And we have this 
result from today as well. And that's why Antoni invited me because uh, he he said that it, it would be nice to popularize this uh, further. Yes, Antoni? Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, actually I'd like to make a very irregular request. Uh, good, I mean, this uh, description of this talk, the coming talk sounds really great. And our problem is one of schedules. There's also a very interesting talk right after yours. There's a uh -huh. colloquial talk of Lubotsky and I was wondering whether uh, anything- We overlap in fact. Overlap? No, 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 no. Uh, Kaluyan's next talk is from 1.30 to 2.30. Lubotsky's talk uh, starts at 3 o'clock. So there is 30 sorry, minutes gap. I mean, sorry, 1.30 one, one which time zone? Sorry. Uh, central, central. So central. Central time. Uh, central what? Central of what uh, continent? Chi Chi Chicago time. Chicago time. Ah, you, you, you mean, I mean, okay, North America continent. Okay, because some people live uh, outside this area. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, it's confusing it's because uh, we switched to winter time here in Europe, but you still haven't switched and uh, it's always confusing. But so Antoni Madaf, thought about it, yes. Uh, so Madhav, what is your request? Can, can you repeat? Uh, uh, yeah, I think the colloquium is more unchangeable. I don't know, because uh, we have a big audience here and we have a speaker and I was going to ask whether there would be any time on Friday. Uh, that we could all meet because I mean, I'd love to hear your talk and I'm pretty sure uh, the effort of paying attention closely, which I'd like to do, will leave me dead for Lubotsky's talk. You know, I'll be a spent force. So if it's possible. Uh, ah, so here is what I can suggest, Madhav, listen. Yeah. So first of all, we record the talks. Maybe I should stop ah, the recording okay. right now. 